my the topic of my presentation is tally ophthalmology in covid era a new chapter so i am dr suresh kumar professor and head department of ophthalmology government medical college chandigarh india so uh, the covid 19 uh, has emerged as a global pandemic since 2019 and world health organization declared it a public health emergency of international concern again in 2019 and coronavirus, if we go into microbiology, it's a single stranded enveloped RNA virus that belongs to subfamily coronavirini. And the spread is through respiratory droplets from one person to another. And for my transmission has also been reported. Uh, in a recent study from China, one third of the patient with COVID-19 have ocular manifestations, maybe conjunctivitis or uh, keratitis and with mo moderate to severe disease. And uh, it has been concluded that possible route of transmission for COVID is also through ocular secretions. So that is a matter of concern in seeing ocular patients for all ophthalmologists because ocular surface is a potential source of contagion. So telemedicine has most of us are aware that we are not directly in contact with the patient and we are just giving consultation either telephonically or through a WhatsApp call or videos or whatever other ways of uh, uh, others way of inspection rather than physical inspection. So it also supports social distancing measures and still we can have continuous service delivery uh, when when all the all the activities have been restricted and a, a recent study also concluded that uh, with tele ophthalmology we can decrease face to face appointment by 16 to 48% a very very significant decrease especially in covid uh, crisis and present uh, the present study basically it analyzed the clinical spectrum of consultations, which which patients are uh, which patients are basically coming for consultation to to an ophthalmologist, and and basically we had real time videos, audios, text interactions, and consultation was given given by a trained ophthalmologist. And it was a cross-sectional observation study. And it included patients who sought uh, consultation over telecommunication or teleophthalmology services from our department, which is a tertiary care center in North India. And it was during uh, 1st May 2020 to 31st July 2020. And consultation were given out over telephone or e-Sinjivni portal of Government of India and smart messaging apps. So data was retrieved by train of ophthalmologists and analyzed. And we found that in span of three months, a total of 181 patients sought medical health through teleconsultation. And 68% patients uh, were basically old patients who, who just wanted follow-up services. And 32% patients were new new registrations and mean age of the study population was 44.05 and median age was 45 years and 64 percent patients were male and 35.91 percent patients were female and again main population reporting to us was urban population 59.67 percent were urban and the rest were urban or semi-rural uh, semi or semi-urban and most of the patients, they had complaints of redness, watering, itching, and asthenopic symptoms. As during COVID time, the screen time of all people across all age uh, distribution were, were increased. So we expected asthenopic symptoms and dryness of eyes. And majority of these patients were diagnosed with conjunctivitis, either allergic or infective, and dry eyes and treatment was given over telephonic conversation and itching and foreign body sensation was more likely to occur among, among patient in urban area 
as compared to rural setting and eye strain was also more commonly seen in urban population again explaining the effects that urban population is more likely to have more higher screen time or longer screen time as compared to rural population this is the age distribution chart showing age distribution and frequency of presenting complaints again look uh, redness and itching these these are the two most uh, important uh, symptoms uh, which which patient presented to us and uh, routine follow up patients like sub specialty clinics we are having in our department is glaucoma services cornea services retina services and gbit services so these patients they they wanted their uh, follow up on on tele ophthalmology and uh, on follow up call after after they were given consultation we again contacted these patients and 94% of these patients were satisfied with with the uh, tele ophthalmology services they were satisfied with the advice we gave with the treatment we uh, handed over to them telephonically and roughly 6% of these patients they were not satisfied and we called them physically to our institute following all covid guidelines so again number of patient having allergic gingivitis uh, was highest 53 and then follow up patients they again found bulk of our patient glaucoma follow up 28 retina follow up 17 cornea follow up 10 cataract follow up 10 and refractive errors again patient requiring glasses they again found 14 uh, 14 patient belong to this group so coming to discussion tele health is uh, defined by who as delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor like patients coming from very far off places and they can't visit the uh, tertiary care center by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technology for exchange of valid information for diagnosis treatment and prevention of disease and injuries research and evaluation and for continuing education of healthcare provider and use of telemedicine in ophthalmology was first reported by hk lee in 1999 around 23 24 years ago and the finding of our study suggested that enforcement of social distancing and lockdown led to a decrease in number of patient presenting to the hospital obviously people won't like to come once there is active pandemic going on and 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 there was sudden surge in use of virtual ophthalmology services and a recent study stated that virtual video calls are effective way for managing low risk cases since it facilitates real time interaction and an online survey among practicing ophthalmologists across india found that preferred mode for remote practice was through telephonic consultation 54% of the ophthalmologists were using this kind of communication for giving services to their patient and it was followed by social media apps like whatsapp and telegram while video call were least preferred by the patient as well as practicing ophthalmologists the limitation however telemedicine is not panacea for everything it has its own set of limitation and a study conducted in us emphasizes that major patient barrier to implementation of tele ophthalmology including included unfamiliarity logistical challenges and concerns regarding accuracy and developing countries like ours we have to address other issues like technically challenged staff high initial investment for server setups reimbursement issues lack of computer literacy again in semi urban or rural patients and poor quality of images and internet connections also and and there is lot of resistance to any change especially in government setup also and among population also policy barriers which needs for regular upgradation of equipment is another issue and access to technology large uh, number of our patients and large population doesn't have access to high technology and then confidentiality and security concerns are another reasons and our study has again limitations as our hospital was not running tele ophthalmology services before covid pandemic so there is no previous record to which we can compare the present results and inter observer variability could be a confounding factor for analysis as on follow up calls the patient were attended by different doctor i mean same doctor can't be there every time uh, we have i mean 
different units and different OPD settings. Also, the clinical profile was evaluated for only three months of initial lockdown. So concluding our study, our experience with teleophthalmology is among the first few studies to be reported from a single center government institute in an urban center. Majority of people uh, who reported to us were from, again, urban areas, and it highlights the disparity in excess of eye care in spite of rising urbanization, and we have to better our services to ensure equitable care to rural sections. And teleophthalmology may help overcome the current ordeal with minimal unfavorable consequences, both for patients and healthcare providers. Thank you very much. Any, any question, any discussion, I will welcome. Yeah, wonderful presentation. Any questions from any participants? Okay, uh, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's very really nice. Uh, good topic with respect to teleophthalmology. Uh, so I believe uh, the technology is very increased, and uh, uh, but uh, how exactly, or you know, um, with respect to uh, the interactions with uh, uh, the ophthalmologist or any doctors, basically, yes. when yeah. we talk uh, in a tele manner, right? Yes. Uh, how much successful will that be? Uh, not uh, for COVID or you know normal precautions or a basic precautions can be said, but uh, I don't think so. But up to major level, it will be helpful unless and until uh, the psychological satisfaction also won't be yes. there. Maybe yes. Uh, again, and, again, I think nothing can replace physical examination in our specialty. We, we uh, technically, we have very advanced equipments. Whenever we want to diagnose cataract, glaucoma, retinal problems, we have to access patient uh, physically with all the equipment. But at least uh, uh, rural population, semi-urban mm -hmm. population who can't come to us easily or, or during uh, like COVID pandemic or whenever, there are restriction of physical examination, then we can uh, rely on telecommunication, teleophthalmology to take care of patients, uh, at least uh, uh, with, with major complaints, which, which can be, I mean, uh, uh, assessed telephonically, and at least some, some uh, basic uh, treatment is provided. And, and then we can call these patients later on for, for real physical examination so it's a like a stop gap arrangement and during emergency crisis we we can uh, i mean take uh, help of teleophthalmology but otherwise it can't replace or substitute our routine clinical practice that that's what i would like to say true, true. Uh, like uh, what are the other uh, areas where now teleophthalmology uh, like you know uh, the teleophthalmology is also focusing on Another another area is dioptic retinopathy. Now India is in the midst of uh, epidemic of diabetes. So a lot of patients, they are having dioptic retinopathy. So a, a fundus camera has been designed, which can be operated by non-ophthalmologists. So they can go to rural areas. So they, they can take photograph of those patients after dilating pupil. And those photographs are transferred to the ophthalmologist at a higher center. And then we screen those photographs. And then uh, if patient is not having any dioptic changes, we just uh, uh, reassure them. And patients having dioptic retinopathy, we call them to our center for laser treatment. Again, we can prevent blindness by timely treating these patients. And another use in glaucoma patient. Again, we uh, fundus camera will take photograph of the disc. And by evaluating the disc, the glaucoma specialist can make out whether patient needs further uh, evaluation and treatment or not. These are two areas which, which where tele services can be used. Great, great, sir. Nice uh, to know that. Uh, uh, so good discussion. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. We would thank love to you, get Dr. in touch with you. Please share your email address and the affiliation. Yeah. Any participants would like to do any biomedical yeah. or you know any ophthalmologist ophthalmologic come um, this you know any his, uh, research on it we would yeah. like to get in touch with you and recently yeah. also yeah. Uh, one of few of my students are working on the one which you mentioned uh, 
diabetic retinopathy they have tried uh, doing some analysis using data science and all okay okay so maybe uh, they didn't have the real data though so okay. they were just using some databases so yeah uh, but in future we can get some collaborations and yeah. are doing some uh, research together definitely definitely collaborations are the need of the hour so across the specialty we have to collaborate so as to have best outcome for humanity correct correct so thank you so thank you thank you. good afternoon to all the uh, uh, participants and panel members present here uh, the topic of my presentation today is um, investigation on the impact of manual and mechanical pollination on date palm cultivar hanezi in the sultanate of oman the co-authors of this paper are shrinivas naik abid siddiq nasir al shamaki nahid al makrashi uh, shafi al shukri these are the outlines of uh, my presentation date palms are the main cultural crop in the middle east and south uh, uh, west asia including the united states and uh, uh, the america the date palms scientifically known as phoenix dactylifera l is a plant species where male and female inflorescences are on uh, separate palms in this case self pollination is impossible and cross pollination is required to produce fruits so here uh, you can see the male and female uh, flowers that are emerging from the spit this is the male uh, flower that is available only in the male palm tree and this is the female uh, flowers which are available in the uh, which are present in the female palms now natural pollination occurs due to winds and insects but these methods of uh, naturally pollinating date palms are highly unreliable uh, due to the uh, presence of or due to the development of um, parthenocarpic fruits those fruits of uh, very low economic value or you can say no economic value now in this case um, natural pollination is not possible and sorry not natural pollination cross pollination is not possible uh, therefore we have to go for artificial pollination to enhance the fruit set and sustain yield levels now there are uh, different traditional methods that have been applied by to pollinate date palms uh, one of the most common method uh, used in the middle east is by manually placing the fresh male spikelet spikelets on the female flowers and uh, the for this the farmer will have to climb every palm tree or every male palm tree to collect the male stamens he then climbs every female palm tree to place two or three strands of these male flowers into the female flower then tie them with a small rope uh, so that the, uh, the, the 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 flowers open or the fruits open with the growth of dates now this particular method is uh, usually time consuming labor intensive accident prone uh, and um, highly uh, you know labor um, cost uh, or having high labor cost so then uh, even then uh, the methods mechanical pollination methods are also been tried in some parts of the globe where uh, they use the uh, uh, liquid uh, method of uh, spraying onto the uh, female flowers or the pollen sprayed onto the female flowers or the dust pollination mechanisms but the farmers are still not very Uh, you know, very convenient or very agreeable with those new methods of pollination uh, due to the lack of awareness on uh, these uh, or the the reluctance to try new methods uh, the uh, non proven studies based on these methods etc so then came the idea why not automate this uh, method now uh, since early times 
there were uh, traditional methods of pollination which includes placing the uh, fresh male spikelets on the um, female flowers by climbing up each and every tree also certain manual and mechanical pollination methods also were tried like the liquid suspension spray techniques or the powder uh, dusting uh, approaches now before designing an automated system for uh, date palm pollination there was a need to study which of these techniques are is better uh, to design the system accordingly now the main objectives of this study is to review two uh, non conventional practices which are the dry and the wet method that can be adopted to pollinate date palms the test the liquid suspension spray techniques and the powder uh, pollination approaches on a common cultivar named the hanezi which is a common uh, cultivar in the sultanate of oman the third objective is to investigate the effect of these dry and wet method on parameters such as yield fruit set fruit quality etc on the cultivar hanezi this study was developed during the 2021 season in the orchard of 25 hectares located in dang in the aldahera governorate of sultanate of oman the irrigation technique was by pullage pullage is a very uh, common irrigation method used in oman Uh, where you have a stream of water flowing from the water source to the plantations um, uh, which serves as the uh, a main irrigation uh, for the crops and the field was uh, mostly organically fertilized palms were derived from hanezi cultivars of 10 years of age and they were planted uh, at an 8 cross 8 uh, distance between the rows 10 hanezi palm trees each were given separate names for identification they were selected randomly and used as female parents one male date palm of 15 years of age and bigger uh, derived from the most common cultivar called as fahal was used as the source of pollen for pollination so this fahal is the uh, male parent three groups of cultivar hanezi palms in each group three or four palm trees each they were made to carry out three types of pollination methods each group was pollinated individually for example the first group with three palm trees were pollinated using the traditional method of uh, placing the fresh male uh, spikelets as commonly done by the farmers in the uh, country uh, second group of three palms were you uh, were uh, pollinated using the dry pollen dusting method and the third group with four palm trees were uh, chosen for uh, pollination mechanism using the liquid suspension spray method pollination was carried out between the second and fourth days after the spathes opened now this slide shows uh, the method of preparation of the uh, uh, date palm pollens using the dry method and the wet method for the three palm trees of group 2 date palm pollens were extracted and diluted with all purpose flour in a mixture at 1 is to 3 ratio for dust pollination two palms were pollinated using hand dusting and one was tried with the mechanical duster spray pollination was done on four palm trees of group 3 and hall uh, sorry hand pollination uh, using liquid suspension spray sprays were done for two palms in the group and uh, the concentration of spray was 4 g per liter and the other uh, was at a concentration of 1.5 g per liter a mechanical sprayer was was used for the other two palm trees this slide shows the uh, date palm pollen extraction process the liquid as well as the uh, powder pollens were extracted at the labs of the our university university of technology and applied sciences ibri now uh, the three groups of trees were labeled for identification and three different techniques of pollination traditional method dry dusting method and the liquid suspension spraying method were applied on um, uh, the uh, selected palm trees now coming to the results uh, 
we have compared the results of the three different pollination uh, methods. The fruit set percentage was found to be highest in the spray pollination technique or the wet pollination technique around 67.8% followed by the traditional uh, method and the least was obtained in the dry dusting method. The bunch weight was higher uh, again in the spray method as well as in the traditional method but the bunch weight was found to be low in the dry uh, method. Fruit diameter and fruit length were also found to be higher in the spray method or the liquid suspension spray pollination. And also it was satisfactory in the case of uh, dust pollination, but the size of the fruits were uh, found to be quite low in the traditional method because of the presence of uh, uh, parthenocarpic fruits. Now the amount of parthenocarpic fruits were found to be highest in the, uh, in the traditional method around 2.95%. But the least parthenocarpic fruit fruits were developed in the spray pollination method around 0.36%, followed by the dust uh, spraying approach, oh, sorry, dust uh, pollination approach around 0.74%. Coming to the date palm pollen consumption, the lowest consumption rate was shown by the spray pollination method, where 0.5 male palm trees were required, were only required to pollinate around 50 female trees. But uh, uh, I mean, again, it is followed by the traditional pollination method where one male palm per uh, 50 females were used. So it's a moderate use of date palm uh, pollens. But the dry dusting method showed that it, it uses high uh, amount of the, uh, date palm pollens, around 1.5 male palm trees were required for 50 females. On an average, the total yield is higher in the spray method as well as the traditional method, but the dusting method did not give uh, much of yield. So overall, if you see the results, the spray pollination had given the optimal results uh, with, uh, you know, the compared to or followed by the traditional method uh, and the least uh, uh, performance was uh, found in the dry pollen dusting method. The point to be noted here is that there are uh, no significant differences between the hand and the mechanical spray or the dust pollination treatments. Now coming to the conclusion, Mechanical pollinators are made use of in recent years that could eliminate the need to climb the palms and thus reduce the work intensity and time, but they suffer from high initial investment, low reliability and controllability. They also need uh, more skilled workers to do the operation. However, successful commercial date palm production uh, requires economically feasible artificial pollination mechanisms to ensure high yield, um, and make it economically feasible to the farmers. The results of this study in cultivar Hanesi show that the spray of liquid pollen suspensions significantly increase the fruit set percentage, bunch weight, and total yield per tree with very low DPP consumption compared to the traditional method and uh, the pollen dusting method. The liquid suspension pollination is the strongly recommended because it is faster, less expensive, and more effective. An innovative spray pollination mechanism using drones and artificial intelligence, which um, consists of a robotic arm and a computer control sprayer is being designed, which is uh, expected to be a promising pollination technology in the future. So for uh, drone pollination, or you can say aerial pollination, the best method is to use a liquid suspension spray in uh, in the, in uh, you know the drone uh, instead of using a, a, a dry dusting uh, method uh, via the drones. This research uh, leading to the results have received funding from the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation of Sultanate of Oman under the research grant program, uh, which uh, with uh, the particular uh, grant agreement number shown here. 
the uh, authors acknowledge the engineering department, University of Technology and Applied Sciences, IBRI, for providing all the logistics and support to carry out or uh, to uh, prepare the pollens and uh, carry out the um, experiments. Uh, also, uh, we acknowledge Mr. Hamis Amel Al Shukri for permitting us to carry out the described study on the cultivar Hanesi in his orchards at Dang in the Sultanate of Oman. These are some of the references that we have gone through. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Ayana, for your wonderful presentation. So, yeah, if the do we have any questions from any participants? Okay, a general question I wanted to understand is that uh, you were just mentioning about uh, the manual and mechanical pollination for uh, when we talked about uh, uh, right for the crops out there. Uh, you were mentioning about drones, right? You were working on it. Yes, um, actually, that is a future study of this work. Okay. Um, right now, in this particular work, we have tried three different mechanisms, three different pollen, uh, pollen, three different types of pollens used in a particular uh, cultivar, and these the results are cultivar specific. So right now, we have studied on cultivar Hanesi. It might not be the same case with uh, another cultivar, maybe Nagal or the Hassab. So we are working on uh, the, these three, uh, you know. Um, uh, types of cultivars and we are in the process of going towards um, making a, an unmanned aerial pollination mechanism with a robotic arm that can be used for spraying these pollens but before uh, designing that but that robotic arm we need to uh, decide whether which of these methods gives us um, best results so uh, should we use a dry pollen dust in our drone uh, for pollinating or should we be using um, uh, a liquid suspension spray or should we be designing a, a robotic arm which can place we can place this trans uh, as it is so after this st initial study first year first year um, experimentation we have come to a conclusion that it is better to use a liquid suspension spray, which is much more easier uh, using the, uh, you know, aerial pollination uh, just by using the sprayer. Agricultural drones can be used to spray the pollens. Another advantage is that we can, we need to use only a less amount of um, pollens because pollens are very, you know, uh, precious you can say expensive and it is difficult to extract viable pollens it is difficult to store viable pollens but uh, uh, definitely if you can uh, you know reduce the uh, tedious pollination process uh, instead of climbing each and every tree to collect and you know pollinate the female palm trees this would uh, provide a uh, better solution uh, without compromising on the yield mm -hmm. yeah. Good one. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, it has a lot of study with respect to the future technologies like robotics doing, uh, the robots doing, the drones doing, uh, the pollination. Uh, yeah, uh, a huge, a very huge uh, area of exploration, basically. And uh, maybe the different, different crops also can be tied, planned for pollination. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, a good, good work, uh, Arena. Uh, nice to. See the presentation. So, my name is Akash Shujanagan, and I would like to thank everyone for granting me this opportunity to present over this conference. So, my project is on PCB port defect detection uh, based on oriented fast and rotational brief with super resolution. So the domain of the, the major area of my domain would be machine learning and the minor area would be supervised learning. So, okay, PCB with a one single defect will cause the entire board to dysfunction actually. That is the main problem with the PCB boards. So only if, with manual mode, it wouldn't be enough to check the quality of the PCB. And hence we are, uh, like there were automated inspections, but this would be much more in depth. And the PCB inspection will uh, 
involve detection of defects and classification of defects. So in our in my proposed algorithm, I have divided it to, to five stages. That is in image registration, pre-processing, image segmentation, defect detection, and defect classification. So yeah, the motivation is uh, again like uh, it will become it dysfunctions uh, with a single defect, and it's not enough with the manual uh, mode of inspection, and it makes the work of repair and detecting defects in electronic devices easier. So we wanted, like I wanted to do the quality inspection in an uh, automated manner. That was my objective, and the system should also achieve hundred percent quality assurance. And quick de detection is also one of my objectives and localization of defects using magic technology. And so in the existing model, there were no classification of defects. So without imaging, it is difficult to pinpoint. And in the proposed, uh, in my proposed system, all the defects will be detected. So these were some of the papers I had referred to. So uh, as you can see, the drawback is no classification of defects. And there was, there were another drawback that is it retains only frequency components and certain uh, only certain defects are being detected as uh, subtracting algorithm can be improved all these were uh, certain kinds of drawbacks so in my proposed system process for de uh, detection and categorization we like i have provided a referential technique that is the statistic technique will consist of five stages scan Planning, pre-processing, image classification, flaw identification, and defect categorization. So scanners are, will be used to eliminate variations in collected test images. And like there are like different uh, variations such as rotation, scale, translation. So these all will be eliminated with the use of scanners. So we'll also go through procedures in uh, reducing the noise. So in image registration, uh, variations in test image were removed. Noise reduction is all and enhancing the image is done in pre-processing. And in image segmentation, images are segmented to the requirement of defects detection. The defects were detected and classified. What type of defect done in defect detection and classification? So the defects will be. Uh, so the benefits of my proposed system are the defects are classified and compared with the template. Defects can be identified accurately, and with imaging the defects, uh, they can be localized precisely. It makes the process of repairs uh, on the PCB board more easy, and with proper rectification, uh, the lifespan of these uh, devices are extended. The problem with these PCB boards, the lifespan of these devices are being uh, reduced drastically. So this is how uh, my system will be working. That is an image will be captured. There will be a template image and a test image. So the template image and the test images will be both converted from RGB image to grayscale image, and then from the grayscale image to the binary image. Uh, the template image will be stored in a database and the test image will be then compared to the uh, template image, which is stored in the database. And if there is a fault detected, it will be shown. And if it's a correct image, it will also be uh, a result will also be given as a correct image. And in anomaly detection, uh, defects will, there are like 14 different kinds of anomalies. So orb is a fusion of fast and brief, and will be uh, will be overcoming the disadvantages in the existing system. So we have used super resolution for uh, noise removal clear scanning. So image scanning, the list of modules are image scanning, image pre-processing, image segmentation, defect detection, and defect classification. And so this would be the architecture. That is a test image will be captured, image registration, that uh, image registration will be done for the test image capture. Standard image, uh, standard template image is also given as an input. And then image register, after the image registration process, grayscale conversion is done of both the test image and the standard template image. And then a median filtering is done for both of them. Low pass filtering with Gaussian filter system. Image segmentation will also be done 
that is whether they have wiring tracks all of their wiring tracks holes and soldering pads then the um, absolute image difference will be uh, done uh, in the absolute image difference the template image will be compared with the test image from the uh, databases so elimination of small areas will be a process and then the defects can be easily classified the results will be displayed so I, here i have given uh, in depth about each module that is in module one image scanning will be done that is uh, so the aim is to remove the variations in terms of rotation and translation input will be test image template image from data set to extract features of test image and match with the uh, template image output may output would be extracted features are matched to uh, then to given to geometric transformation and given test image is converted into format of template image Module two is image pre-processing, and input given is register test image and matching template image. And the aim is to remove the noise and enhance image resolution. Output will be to uh, enhance it with the image registered is enhanced with super resolution. Image is then converted to grayscale and remove of salt and pepper noise by further enhancement with median filtering and Gaussian low pass filtering. Then we have image segmentation. So we'll uh, segment the PCB board into classified path parts such as wiring tracks and soldering paths, holes, etc. And input given would be process test image and its corresponding template image. Output would be images represented into different sets of pixels, and parts will be segmented. Module four is defect detection and classification. And the aim is to detect the defects in the segmented images. Input would be the segmented images and template image. Output again would, output would be segmented images are compared with the template image. Defects are detected by image subtraction. Defects are classified by positive and negative defects. So this is the UML diagram. Again, the artificial first uh, defect-free PCB image is given as an input and we'll store that in the database and an artificial pcb image with uh, defects is compared with a defect free pcb using image comparison techniques and the defect detection and, and class defects will be defected and uh, detected and classified accordingly so, so yeah these are the different attributes that uh, i have used there are 15 attributes and the software and hardware requirements would be uh, you need an hardware requirements would be intel processor a ram could be at least uh, 4 gb and you could have clock rate about 2.4 gigahertz and pcb board is needed a scanner is needed software requirements could be always can be windows 7 8 or 10 8.1 or 10 visual studio board jupyter notebook and python so these are some of the images. This is an image of the module one. And yeah, output would be like this. Yeah, I am done with here. Thank you. Hello, Ravi. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm done with my presentation. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was just uh, good. Uh, good work. Uh, just wanted to any any questions from other participants. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, nice work. Uh, like you have done this in, through image processing or what? Uh, in... Yeah. Uh, Ravi, that is. Uh... Image your voice is a little low yeah i have done it using image processing techniques okay 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 so uh, basically you are comparing the uh, actual pcb circuits and uh, the system one uh, using uh, uh, how it is performing is it yeah we'll give a template image actually that would be the correct uh, pcb codes without any defects okay um, okay 
once you want to uh, compare it, that is, you give a defect uh, a PCB board with the defects, then it will immediately point out the uh, very easily it can point out the defects. This would be very difficult in manual inspections. Okay. Well, uh, thank you uh, for your wonderful presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, topic that we're going to talk about today is a research that I did with my um, colleagues. Um, my name is Rapaz and Sigun um, first, and um, I'd like to introduce other co-authors as well. The first one is um, Associate Professor Supapon Prasong Tan, who is my colleague at the State University. And another co-author is um, Ms. Sirirat Nishapat, who is a lecturer at the Turkey Vendit University and both universities are in Bangkok. Okay. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about the background of the um, this research. Okay. Um, this research is about the um, service case of the hostels. And um, from the literature review, we could see that there has been many research studies conducted um, on the service case in many service settings. For example, there are some researchers um, conducted a research in um, service capital hotels. Um, there are some research studies conducted in the setting of the um, hospitals, for example, or food service industry. And from our literature review, we could see that um, there's a few studies on the um, service care of the hostel. And um, most of the study on the of the hostel was conducted years ago. And the earliest one was conducted um, as far as I remember, 2004. So um, since then, um, we could see that there has been a lot of change in the hostel business throughout the world. Um, that's why we'd like to um, investigate the perception of the guests um, staying at the hostels to reflect and the picture of the prison um, hostel industry. Okay, um, there are many factors that contribute to the changes um, of the hostel businesses around the world. And um, the first factor is the emergence and the expansion of the low cost airlines. And um, the expansion of the low cost airlines and um, make people who have limited budget to travel further to many new des destinations. And when these people, when they travel, um, not only they look for um, cheap transportation, they will be looking at the affordable accommodation as well. So hostel would be one um, kind of the accommodation establishment that they are looking for. So we could see that um, because of the expansion of um, the low cost airlines and a growing number of hostels um, in many destinations throughout the world of the demand of the low budget trump. And the second thing is that um, in many developed destinations throughout the world, um, the cost of the land is increasing. So even um, many investors like to develop 
the hotel, it would require a large land plot. But um, because of the cost of the land, and um, there might be a limited space to uh, invest in new hotels, which require um, a larger space, many people would um, have no choice to invest that in the hostel instead. So these are two important factors due to the growth of the hostel that's over the decade. And um, as there is a growing number of new hostels, they are compete, they're competing each other. And because the hostel is like a um, dormitory style, mostly they provide only bait and you have got to share a room um, with others and you have got to use the share public areas. So one of the um, key strategies that most hotels use throughout the world is that they try to um, decorate, try to um, improve on the service care or tangible environment of the hotels. So we could see that in many um, developed destinations like Bangkok, um, hostels do not only provide a simple bed and a chair space, but they do decorate, they try to um, do the appealing lighting within the, hot within the hostels. They would provide some of the um, um, beautiful equipments within the hostels as well. So this is reasons why we'd like to um, investigate the um, service care elements of the hostel from the perception of the guests. So overall, um, our main research objectives, uh, we have two objectives. Um, the first one, we would like to explore the perceived importance and performance of the hostel service care from the perception of the guests who stay at the hostels in Bangkok. And the second objective, we would like to examine the effect of hostel service care on guest satisfaction and loyalty. So we designed the research methods. Um, in this research, we use the um, questionnaire survey um, to collect the data. So um, our questionnaire consists of um, three parts. Um, the first part, we ask the respondents to answer about um, general and demographic questions like age, um, gender, um, average income, and the, um, the residents. Um, this is the first part. And the second part, we measure the importance and importance of the hostel service care attributes. In our research, um, we, adopt, we adopted the scale um, developed by Arifin and other um, researchers as well. Um, finally, we use four elements of the service care, which are facility aesthetics, um, ambience, and layout. And the last one is sleeping comfort. So we ask the, um, the respondents to um, one by one item to, um, to assess the importance of each element. And at the same time, once they have stayed at the guest, uh, at the hostel, we ask them to um, assess the performance or the quality of each element as they get during their stay. So um, this is the second part. And the third part, we measure the, um, sorry, not importance, I think it's wrong, and the slide is wrong. And the third part, we measure the um, satisfaction and the uh, loyalty. So again, we use the developed scale um, that um, has been used throughout the um, tourism literature. And for the data collection, um, we started to do this research um, at the start of COVID-19. At first, we um, expected to collect 400 um, guests, respondents, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we could get only 130 respondents. And um, we used the convenience sampling um, to um, collect the data from the um, 10 hostels throughout Bangkok. And for the data analysis, um, to answer the first objective of our research, um, the first one is we would like to compare the performance and importance of the service care elements. Um, in this study, um, we use the IPA analysis or importance performance analysis. For the important performance analysis, um, 
is it a two dimension metric based on the um, importance and pavement? As you can see from the figure here, that the um, vertical axis is the importance and the horizontal axis is the pavement. So here you have a two R uh, multiply two matrix, which um, the um, service cap elements could be categorized in four groups. And the first one, um, as we call it, concentrate here. In, in, in this quadrant, um, it means that the element um, this is very important, but um, the hostel might not be able to deliver um, the quality of the um, service cap element as the guests would expect. So they call it concentrate here because um, this area needs a lot of improvement. Okay? And the second quadrant um, is a keep up good work. In this area, um, the elements that would fall in this area means that um, those elements are very important. And at the same time, um, the hostel could deliver good performance on those elements. So um, if any element that falls in, the, in this quadrant, it means that um, the hostel are doing good in that area. And the third quadrant, um, we call it low priority, which means that these elements, um, the customers or the guests would think um, they're not very important. But at the same time, they could not be able to deliver high performance. So it is actually if um, the hotel owners like to improve, and um, this might be the area they could improve, but um, it is the area with low priority. So if they, observe, they, they would like to improve, and um, the quadrant one is more important. Okay. And the, the last one, the quadrant four, um, is it the area that they, the element is low in importance? but it is high in, in the performance, which means that the, 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 the guests might not expect these very, very much, but the hostel could do very well. So um, in this study, we will calculate um, the overall mean of the performance and the overall means of the importance to locate um, the grid line here and here to divide them into four, four quadrants. And then we will locate which element fall in which cut that is IPA to answer the, um, the, the first objective of the research. And for the first objective, you also um, use the pair T test to compare um, the significant difference between um, importance and performance of each element as well. And for the second objective that we would like to explore um, the influence of service care elements on satisfaction and on loyalty, we will use the regression analysis um, to um, to do that. Okay. And here is the results. But before I go into the uh, the main results, I'd like to talk briefly about the profile of the um, of the respondents, which um which I didn't include in the in the PowerPoint slides. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have 130 respondents participating in our survey, and um, most of them, actually, it's 70 percent um, of the respondents were male, and um, most of the respondents were single, with 60 percent, and um, and 41 percent of them are from European with 16% um, around 16% from North America and 16% um, from Asia. And the rest are equally distributed from um, Australia and Oceania and Africa and South America. And for the income, um, most of the respondents, about 38% of the um, respondents um, have the income less than um, 1,000 US dollars. Um, this is general uh, information about the profiles of respondents. Now, I'd like to show you the, um, the results from the IPA. So, as I mentioned earlier, we have got to calculate the overall um, mean of the important um, elements first to locate the grid line here 
So for the importance uh, element, we have the mean of 4.121. So this is like um, divided between high importance and low importance area. And at the same time for the performance side, um, we use the um, mean to um, locate the grid line here. And the overall mean is 4.166. So we, divide, um, we use this um, means to um, make the IPA metrics. And then we locate um, each service cave. As I mentioned earlier, there are four elements of the service cave in our study. Layout, sleeping comfort, ambience, and facility aesthetics. So we could see that, um, sorry. So we could see that layout falls onto quadrant one with a concentrate here. So it means that a um, layout of the hostel is a um, factor that needs a lot of improvement as compared to other elements. And if you look at the sleeping comfort, um, it falls into the quadrant two, um, which means that um, for the sleeping comfort, I guess I, um, the hostel could do very well. And at the same time, um, the expectation, the importance of this element is very high. So in this, which means that for the sleeping comfort, um, the hostel, the, the, the hostel should do very well and meet the um, high expectation of the of guest. And if you look at um, quadrant three, because that you could see that ambience falls onto this quadrant, which means that ambience um, is a low, is low in uh, importance from the perspective of the, of the guest. And at the same time, um, the hostel could deliver um, not at a good quality here. So as I mentioned earlier, it might be an area that need improvement, but um, if you compare ambience with um, layout, layout would need um, more um, improvement, urgent improvement than the um, than the. And if we look at the quadrant four, we could see that um, facility aesthetics of onto the quadrant, um, which means that um, the customers don't think and um, facility aesthetics might be very important. But for the hostels, from from their perception, it, they they ask us that um, the host, the hostels could do quite very well. So it exceeding the expectation. And we also compare. Um, the mean difference between um, important performance um, of each element is small. See that is only one element that has the significant difference, which is the facility aesthetics. This is the result of the IPA. And to answer the um, second objective of the research, which we would like to explore the um, service cap elements, um, see how they affect the satisfaction and loyalty of the guests. So this table shows the results of regression analysis um, of the, um, of the um, service cap elements on the satisfaction. And we could see that um, the overall um, the model could explain 55.8% um, of the um, dependent variables whose satisfaction. And if you look at the, um, each of the elements here, you can see that facility aesthetics, um, ambience, and layout um, significantly influence the satisfaction of the guests, while the sleeping um, does not Statis statistically um, affect the satisfaction of the guests. So, um, if the um, hostels like to um, improve the satisfaction of the and we concentrate on these three elements here, which are the facility aesthetic ambient layout. And finally, um, we would like to see the, the, the effect of the um, service care elements on the um, loyalty of the gas. And we could see that from four service care elements, there's, there's only one element that would affect they the facility um the loyalty of the guests, which is the facility aesthetic. So from the previous slide, 
which um, inform that um, these three elements, facility aesthetics, ambience, and layout, would affect the satisfaction. But however, if um, the hostel would like to improve the loyalty of the guests, um, it ha they have to concentrate on a um, facility instead. Okay. And this is all of my um, presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, well, uh, good presentation. It was. Uh, nice to see a good presentation. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, your uh, with respect to your results are very nice and the presentation is very nice. I wanted to understand the implementation and the data sample size, how much it was, and uh, 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 and also with respect to your population. About the population? Yes. Um. Actually, because the, the is it the infinite population, um, and there is no um, recorded statistics about the number of um, people staying in hostels in in Thailand. Yeah, we I I understand that from my um, research viewpoint, and um, the sample size is very small. But um, I think um, because of the COVID nineteen, um, mm -hmm. we could not collect the data as much as we want. And uh, geography is also not mentioned. Uh, it is a uh, little bit vague. I mean, you know, uh, uh, the perception of your title is uh, basically it is not indicating which geography of the hotel segment or, you know, which area or which part you're talking about. Perception okay. of uh, you know, service scape in the hotels you have mentioned which place or which area, geography, that would uh, make more apt because uh, geography to geography, area to area, the perception changes and also the uh, population changes as well as uh, uh, the, uh, the responses may change. Yes, actually, I um, we collected the data from the guests staying at the hostels in Bangkok and mm -hmm. uh, this is the area. Okay, okay. In Bangkok. Mm -hmm. I, maybe I forgot to mention about maybe that. Maybe that, that population or that uh, total number of hotels uh, which is surveyed and also uh, a number of hotel, uh, population and those things uh, would have given much more clarity, but except that uh, the presentation was wonderful. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michaela Koupkova and with my colleague Lucia Samkova, we would like to tell you about our paper on the topic of pilot research on integrated transport system and sharing accommodation in Netherlands. Let's start with the introduction. 
Uh, the sharing economy is sharing of commodities or property or renting or exchanging them. In this area, we will mainly deal with the accommodation services. Uh, the most popular sharing accommodation platform is Airbnb, which is uh, very well known. Airbnb was founded in 2008 and it is based in San Francisco. Since then, it has grown uh, to more than 4 million hosts who have accommodated more than 1 billion guests in approximately 100,000 cities worldwide. Uh, sharing accommodation is depend on transport availability. Uh, the concentration of Airbnb accommodation becomes greater in the closer uh, it is to major public uh, connections. They also uh, reported a greater number of sharing accommodation is located in the area with uh, better transport uh, accessibility. Uh, the Integrated Transport System, ITS, is the interconnection of all types of urban and regional transport into one unit. Uh, transport within the ITS is usually provided by various means of public transport, for example, bus, trolley bus, tram, subway, ship, and so, and by various carriers. Uh, the timetables, tariffs, and information are coordinated, uh, and this offers passengers easier transport around the city or region. ITS offers a number of advantages, such as connectivity, easy purchase of single ticket, uniform tariffs, easily accessible and uh, quality information. It mostly focuses on the integration of public transport and its vehicles, but it is also important to focus on the integration of individual and public transport systems. This integration can be done by building interconnection uh, transport infrastructure, such as park and ride car parking and multimodal terminals. Uh, the name means a car park where the user leaves his vehicle, for example, car, motorcycle, or bike, and continues by different public transport to the city center. This car park is located on the outskirts of cities and offers benefits for passengers who use uh, public transport to the city center. Uh, park and ride allows a transfer between an individual private car and individual public transport or only public transport. Uh, the aim of this paper is to evaluate the approach to tourism, especially to transport services and sharing economy in the Netherlands through expert opinion in form of closed questions. Uh, you can see our hypothesis. Um, the data collection was directly in the Netherlands, in the capital of Amsterdam and the uh, city of Rotterdam in the period from the 6th to 13th of April, 2022. Uh, the quest, uh, constructed uh, questionnaire, which was used previously in the state of Mexico, was used for the research in the Netherlands, so it's possible to consequently compare individual states. Unfortunately, the return of the questionnaires uh, was 36%. Uh, uh, during this research was also observed and researched the current state of ITS, especially uh, public transport and P plus R uh, car parks and shared services. So currently, the number of park and dry parking lots in European cities are increasing. Uh, the whole of Netherlands has large amount of bicycle traffic, so it has many bicycle park, uh, bike and ride. Uh, the capital city Amsterdam has 10 park and ride, and the loca location you can see in the picture. Uh, to use discounted all-day parking after parking the vehicle, it was necessary to buy a special ticket uh, which was very uh, well marked where to buy it. Uh, this ticket must be used to uh, ride to the area designed as center within one hour, and the passenger must not forget to mark the ticket when boarding and exiting the means of transport. Uh, when returning to the car park, this process is repeated with the same ticket. During paying the parking fee, you have to select park and ride discount, load uh, used ticket, and the price is reduced. Now about price, parking in the park and ride parking costs uh, one or eight euro for 24 hours, and can be used for a maximum of 96 hours. And public transport ticket prices, you can see uh, here the prices. 
uh, discovered pros and cons, the sophisticated website, which describes in detail how to use Park and Ride in Amsterdam can be evaluated very positively. It is also possible to find the current availability of parking spaces in the given locations. Uh, park and Ride parking option is conveniently marked. The ticket machines are well marked and easy to use. The system of marking the ticket when the boarding and after exiting can be inconvenient for passengers because they have to think about it. Uh, but the system enables, for example, the subsequent uh, acquisition of statistical data uh, on the use of ITS during the park and ride service. We discovered a shortcoming that the camera that captures vehicle license plates doesn't appear to be related to foreign license plates because in the Czech Republic, the license plate starts with EG 7 ca and the camera to this as 7 cb uh, In the questionnaire, we include a question about the tourism potential in the region. You can see it uh, in the table. According to the results, we can see the experts evaluate recreation tourism as the greatest potential in the Netherlands, followed by culture and social. Uh, the least is evaluated spa tourism and na nature tourism. Uh, in the questionnaire, we also include a question about the type of tourists who are visiting the Netherlands. You can also see the results in the table. According to the results, we can see expert consider young people or students to be the segmented most within the Netherlands. And um, we also include the questions relating to the most used uh, type of accommodation and about the most used mode of transport in the Netherlands. Uh, you can also see the results in a table. According uh, to these results, we can see the expert consider hotels as the mainly used type of accommodation during the tourist stay and the public transport is the most used mode of transport. Uh, overall, the use of uh, park and ride uh, in Amsterdam can be evaluated positively, as parking in the center and uh, at the hotels are very expensive. In this way, a person leaves the vehicle on the sidelines, easily buys a ticket, travel to the city uh, by integrated transport, which is uh, numerous and well connected, and doesn't have to worry about uh, his or her vehicle any further. Thus, um, tourists can more easily choose between uh, available accommodation. For example, it's not a problem to find Airbnb without the possibility of parking. Uh, many researches show uh, that P plus R uh, reduces the number of cars in the city centers. According to the results, we can see hypothesis number one can be considered as confirmed. The experts evaluate recreation tourism as the greatest potential in the Netherlands. Hypothesis number two uh, cannot be considered as uh, confirmed. Experts consider young people or students to be segmented most within the Netherlands, uh, followed by foreigner and exclusive clientele. Hypothesis number three can be considered as a confirmed. Experts consider hotels as the main use type of accommodation during the tourist day, and Airbnb is the second most used type. Hypothesis number four can be considered as confirmed as well. The public transport is uh, mostly used uh, mode of transport according to expert opinion level. The second most used transport mode is uh, surprisingly the taxi, which can also be due to pi, uh, P plus R parking lots when it could be more convenient for tourists to use a taxi service than to move around the annual city with their own uh, car. Future research in this area should focus on the real impact of park and ride car parks, the appropriate allocation, the possibilities of alternative P plus R concepts, and the promotion uh, and visibility. Here you can see shortly our literature, just an example of it. And I would like to mention that uh, our uh, presentation is supported by the grant agency of University of South Bohemia in České Budějovice and it's called Impact of Integrated Transport System on Interesting Interest in Sharing Affirmation Services for Locust Travelers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lucy and Michael, for your wonderful presentation. So, yeah, uh, 
good presentation and nice topic I wanted to understand like uh, you have uh, mentioned with respect to netherlands and the of uh, of uh, the uh, topic which you have chosen with respect to tourism is very nice uh, so uh, i was just uh, going through the questionnaires also so uh, you have mentioned yourself like with respect to airbnb hotels and other things so uh, anything apart from airbnb uh, there will be different types of uh, you know applications also with respect to it so how did you choose this airbnb uber talk taxi nothing is it widely used in that country like how, how on what basis you chose airbnb or uber uh, all these things the point was here with respect to you in one of your questionnaire uh, evaluate how you agree with following statement airbnb is cheaper airbnb is more accessible so you are just uh, is it like uh, your research is been sponsored by airbnb uh yes yes we are focus mainly on airbnb uh because for example couchsurfing is also um, sharing economy but it's a little bit different story <laughs> okay okay because i didn't see any other applications rather than airbnb so i was a little curious about like uh... yeah yeah we are focusing on sharing economy so for example booking or etc uh it's a different type of uh, platform okay okay thank you my uh, this uh, presentation is design and development of aluminum silicon carbide <laughs> composite spur gear under static loading conditions well about work this aluminum silicon carbide composite are currently widely used in structure automobile aerospace aerospace and many other sectors as the world is moving towards the electronic vehicles we are reducing weight is really a most challenging task lightweight gear design and manufacturing become the most needful in the current time as we all know in the same order in this work design and development of aluminum silicon carbide composite spur gear was carried out through finite element matter effect of different percentages of sic in aluminum composite was also analyzed through numerical analysis i have analyzed uh, three percentages 5 7.5 and 10 the value of bone mice stresses and deformation was major for each composite composition through fem it was found that aluminum 7.5% silicon carbide composite shows better performance as compared to other comparisons of aluminum sic composite i have taken three considerations 5% 7.5 and 10 introduction the <laughs> the gear system that is used in a mechanical power system is one of the most important components a gear is a, a spinning component that has teeth and intact with another tooth element the most common kind of gear spur gear have teeth that are built for strength and are placed such that they are perpendicular to the shaft axis these gears have a broad variety of uses like equipment mills that cut metal power plants machine engines gasolines pumps and washing machines uh, i have given a reference of one paper that <laughs> that have put up a proposal for an investigation of a composite material spur gear operating under static loading conditions they came to the conclusion that the aluminum sic composite that was generated by stir casting offered superior level of hardness and tensile strength in comparison to the base metal same thing i have referred and uh, i have prepared the model uh, through stir casting method according to the finding of the research the addition of sic content led, led to an increase in the significant variance in the material's hardness as well as its toughness these are the in this work uh, aluminum 6061 silicon compo composite was used for the manufacturing of spur gear detailed finite element analysis was done through ansys ansys 16 i have taken the static analysis of aluminum silicon carbide composite as done and calculates the value of equivalent stress and strain for different loading condition these are the dimensions that i have taken to prepare the model this 
the number of teeth 20, a pitch circle diameter that I've taken 127, pressure angle 20, addendum radius 69.85, denundum uh, 55.88, face width 25.4, soft radius 31.75. Based on the ever mentioned geometric dimensions of the solid model of the spur gear assemble was made. The solid model of gear assembly considered during the FEM analysis shown in the below figure. These are the material properties uh, that I have taken in this work that I have taken the aluminum 6061 alloy with 7.5% silicon carbide, sorry. Silicon carbide composite material was considered to manufacture gear. All the properties of aluminum 7.5 silicon carbide composite used for current FEM analysis is mentioned in the table. Meshing and boundary conditions. After developing the solid model of gear assembly, meshing was done. Different meshing tools were used to optimize the number of node and element. In the current work, the gear assembly was discretizing into 1359, uh, 1359 number of elements. Fixed support is applied on the inner rim of the lower gear. Frictionless support is frictionless support is applied on the inner rim of upper gear to allow its tangential rotation but restrict from radial translation. That I have taken for as a boundary conditions. Movement of 100 newton meter newton millimeter is applied on the inner rim of upper gear in clockwise direction as a driving torque. These are the meshing of spur gear assemblies and uh, figure. These are the figures for loading conditions applied on gear assemblies. Finally, that the result and discussion part. After applying the boundary conditions on spur gear assembly on the value of equivalent stress and strain was calculated for 150 Newton meter torque. I have taken two torque, 150. It also calculates the fatigue life of the gear with different loading conditions. The first figure is uh, for the 100 Newton meter <coughs> millimeter torque from uh, contour plots. It is found that for 100 Newton millimeter torque, the value of maximum equivalent stress for aluminum SIC composite spur gear is 258.15 MPa, where the value of equivalent stain is 0 0.00129. Mm <coughs> through contour plots, it is clear seen that at the contact point of gear, the stress gets concentrated, <coughs> concentrated in that zone that we have we can see. Just okay. This is for. 15 newton meter torque contour plots of equivalent stress and strain is shown in these below figures. The value of equivalent stress for 50 newton millimeter torque is 129.08, which is less as compared to 100 newton millimeter torque. The same kind of trend was also seen in case of equivalent strain. The value of uh, equivalent strain for 50 Newton millimeter aluminum silicon composite spur gear is 0 0.0006, which is much less as compared to other material previously used for spur gear manufacturing. I have compared these two things. And finally, uh, the conclusion is when the findings are analyzed, it can be observed that the stress and strain values for the aluminum matrix, aluminum silicon carbide composite spur gear was at their lowest possible level because of the high strength to weight ratio of the aluminum metal matrix composites. The spur gear model has a high load bearing capacity. This also makes the spare gear rigid and stiff. As the strain values of 0 0.0006 and 0 0.0129 under the torque load of 100 Newton mm and 50 Newton mm respectively are very minimal and <laughs> negligible. We can see this by looking at the model of the spur gear. Since the von Mises stress that are determined from the structural analysis was lower than the yield stress of the metal matrix composite, it was shown that a design is both safe and uh, practicable. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Welcome everybody. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Charge Trigger Itself Assembled Carbon Nanotube Constructs for Effective EMI Shielding Application. Uh, before I get to the results, let me quickly tell you why we are concerned with electromagnetic interference shielding. As we all know that our cell phones operate at a particular frequency and with increasing 4G, 5G, the operating frequency is also higher. It also means that there can be interference from nearby electronic devices, and therefore there should be a way to mitigate this problem by providing an effective shielding across the precise electronics. So to this end, uh, what our research group at ISC has done is we took uh, IPN membrane, interpenetrated polymeric network. Why did we choose this membrane? Is because it can trigger charge. And what we have done is we triggered charge and we added carbon nanotubes in such a way that there is an electrostatic assembly uh, over, over the IPN membranes. So if you can see this one. So as you can see, there is a charge triggered IPN membrane. And uh, first, first step is to create this membrane by adding okay, There is some background noise, sorry about that. No, no, yeah, um, we have muted it. Please go ahead. Okay, sure. So, as you can see on the slide, that these membranes have a very unique porous structure. So, there are there are pillar-like structures, which, which are called finger-like, and then there is a sponge. And then, since we triggered charge, we we know that the charge on the, on the membrane and an oppositely charged carbon nanotubes were then added, so that now you have a construct where through electrostatic assembly, the CNTs are anchored onto this membrane. And our technology shows that this is scalable. We are able to do this up to A4 sheet size and it's flexible, foldable, and lightweight. So these constructs, which can be easily made by electrostatic assembly has numerous advantages. As you can see that the DC conductivity is about 92 Siemens per centimeter and the shielding effectiveness, effective shielding effectiveness is very high, which I'll show you in a minute. So these are the porous structures and if you, carefully observe the figure D, you can actually see the IPN membrane and the CNT construct over the IPN membrane obtained using electrostatic assembly. So just to show you how the conductivity changes when we uh, make different constructs. So the IPN construct shows uh, bulk conductivity of the order of 10 power minus seven, whereas the surface conductivity as I showed you was as high as 92 siemens per centimeter. Uh, our LED bulk can also glow, which also means that the surface conductivity is is very high. So now we have carried out uh, the EMI shielding on these membranes. Higher the dB, EMI shielding is measured in dB. Higher the dB, higher is is uh, or better is, is is in terms of practical applications. So all our membranes, which has carbon nanotubes sitting over it, are uh, uh, do show very high shielding, greater than forty dB in a very broad band frequency range, as you can see from eight gigahertz all the way up to 26 gigahertz, we have very high shielding. And we have measured also the uh, fraction that is reflected and fraction that is absorbed. And what we have observed here is most of our membrane the absorption is quite high. So this is one of the key requirements besides conductivity that the absorption percentage should be higher so that uh, if it is, if it reflects, then it is going to interfere with the neighboring devices. But if it is fully absorbed and dissipated as heat, then we don't have the issue of interference with the nearby devices. So we have also used some simulation to check whether the shielding effectiveness that we calculated is matching with or, or matching with the known models. Simon formalism is one such model which explains the shielding by absorption, and our results match with the Simon's formalism which means that these materials are good absorbers. And attenuation constant is something that tells us about how much fraction of income electromagnetic radiation is attenuated. And what we see is attenuation constant is very high for our IPM CMT construct membrane. Same is uh, the green index. So green index tells us that most of the reflection is absorbed and very, very little reflection, very little incoming EM radiation is reflected. So our green index is about 1.8 at a particular gigahertz frequency. So C1 to C3 indicates uh, all the different uh, membranes that we have made. And uh, we are just comparing it with our IPM CMT construct. Therefore, these are the sampling points. 
So in summary, we have designed a general or a universal strategy to fabricate a CNP construct over an IPN through electrostatic assembly. So this strategy proved to be very efficient in terms of shielding performance. The construct is quite lightweight, as I showed you, mechanically robust because we have subjected these membranes to different bending and uh, different bending cycles. So it could withstand 10,000 bending cycles. It shows a very high conductivity and a very high shielding effectiveness of about 45 dB in a wide frequency range. So apart from this, uh, apart from this, it offers potential material for EMI shielding performance. So IP and CNT constructs could be a universal approach to, to design uh, materials that can actually effectively shield electromagnetic radiations. So thank you, sir. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take it up. It's a great presentation and a nice topic indeed. Uh, wanted to know the applications and the implementation perspective of your research, sir. Like, uh, where in all the applications we can use it in a common right so sir uh, these are uh, paper thin so which means they can easily be inserted in electronic devices like for example mobile phones in order to protect uh, the precise electronics inside it so since they are very thin about uh, 120 micron thick so which means they can be inserted as a packaging material in, in different electronics over the chip or over the transmitter and so on Wonderful, sir. And what is the uh, and how is it man, uh, like uh, manufactured using the uh, how, what was this manufacturing technique you, which you used here? Is uh, it so, a center, uh, like sensor center? Or you uh, no, so here a very simple strategy of vacuum filtering on the membrane was done. So this was uh, one of the easy way of depositing carbon nanotubes on a charge triggered membrane. So it's a simple vacuum filtration. But it's very effective because uh, the membrane on which it is being vacuum filtered is triggered with a negative charge. Wonderful, sir. Very nice to hear that. And uh, what is the cost of uh, you know um, applications? Uh, I understood like uh, um, right. uh, when we see like what is the use of it when we apply in a common term. If you can conclude it, because people are also here from many other different backgrounds, so that would be great. Yes. Like maybe uh, what are the uh, benefits it comes with uh, right. with respect to implementation of these? Uh... Sure. So that's a nice question, sir. So carbon nanotubes are known to be highly conducting and are used in EMI shielding application. But in the case of composites, you need to add a lot, let's say 20 to 30 volume percent in order to realize 40 dB of shielding. However, in this case, since the carbon nanotube is on the surface, which is electrostatically bound to the membrane, you actually need very little you know, to, to reach 40 dB of shielding. And since it is added little, the cost-wise also, it is quite cheaper and processing becomes easy as compared to the composites. So in this way, the electronics items will become cheaper uh, as Correct. what you mean? Yes, yes, okay. very much. So what are the, you know, uh, like, uh, the next way of implementation or you have planned it, I mean, it's, an, it's right. out of the box question though. Right, right. No, as actually, I see the right. first slide, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just curious because whatever the research you do, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, sure. the organization or the institute you're affiliated will be looking for producting it. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. So what we have done is we have been talking with Boeing and uh, LAM research. So they were quite fascinated because uh, this technology can be very well be deployed uh, in their electronics. Uh, for example, electronics in the cockpit, which needs to be protected from external surge of electromagnetic radiation. So they were very interested. LAM research wanted to use it on sensors for different applications. So this technology will be soon transferred to them. Uh, discussions are on and sure very soon it will be transferred to them. So some preliminary test trials have been done. Sorry, yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, good to hear. Uh, the implementation you, is already in progress. Right. Nice to see the research work, sir. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, with this, I believe, uh, I mean, a uh, great thing. Any any collaborations or anything from any other universities can reach out to uh, you and yes. maybe some work collaboratively can also be planned out. I sure, sure. So we have multiple collaborative partners within India. 
uh, but we are open to collaborating with uh, other uh, other universities and organizations. Uh, IIC is very open uh, uh, for such active collaborations, and I'm also looking forward to. That's great. So please share your email address also out there in the chat box. So uh, we will sure. see how uh, we can work out together and or any other organization. Sure, uh, sure. Affiliated people out here can reach out. Perfect. That's really uh, nice sure. research work. Sure. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this has been done in your laboratory only. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, which which lab, uh, sir? So this is I'm from Indian Institute of Science. Bangalore. And I understand that. Right. Uh, materials engineering. Okay, in material engineering lab. So, uh, like, uh, what exactly uh, in this? Uh, I mean, what lab? You have used to do this is what my question was. Okay, so I'm heading a polymer processing group here. So my lab is called polymer processing group. So this is where the experiments were conducted. Polymer processing groups. Yes. That's yes. great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. The wonderful Thank uh, you. Nice getting in touch with you. Uh, so you, we will see how best collaborations can be done from different universities. I would also like to connect with you personally. Thank you. Sure, sir.